Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A talent can be a tricky thing that's hard to define. When most people think of a talent, they think of something that they can do and that they're good at. Such talents can range from being a good cook to flying an airplane. And to be sure, God has a use for each and every one of them. But the talents mentioned in today's reading are a little different. The talent we read about in Matthew is, in fact, an ancient used unit of measuring currency that was roughly equivalent to the body weight of the average person, which at that time was about 110 pounds. So I did a little math, and here's what I figured out. If the master in our reading today gave his servants their talents in gold, he would have given them the following amounts in today's money. According to the gold prices I looked up earlier this week, five talents or 550 pounds of gold is $16,491,200. Two talents or 220 pounds of gold is equal to $6,000,000. $596,480. And one talent, or 110 pounds of gold, is equal to $3,298,240. Now that's a lot of talents. And so you can imagine the amount of pressure that must have been on each of the servants mentioned in our parable. Being entrusted with this much money is a difficult thing at the very least. And if you didn't know what to do with it, it could be a serious problem. Because you see, being a servant at the time this was written, about 30 AD, was a tough job. Unlike our employment today, the job of a servant was somewhat dangerous. It could happen that if your master was at any time unhappy with your performance, they could do whatever they wanted. They could sell your family or maybe just your children. And if they were so inclined, they could terminate your employment permanently by exercising their right to destroy their property. You see, back then, if you were a servant, you were owned. And that meant your master had possession of your life. So maybe we can see how the servant who didn't do anything with his talent came to that conclusion. Instead of risking his life and potentially losing the talent, he buried it in the ground and didn't take any chances. Frankly, and you might identify with this, if my life was on the line, I'd be afraid too, and I wouldn't be inclined to take too many risks. So. How does this all relate to our stewardship series, Living with Giving, you might ask? Well, Pastor McDowell did a great job last week explaining to us how to give whenever he discussed the idea of giving proportionally. My task this week is to tackle why to give. And that's where the sacrificial part comes into play. You see, I understand that we don't all have one talent's worth of gold in our bank accounts. And for many of us, it can be difficult to even pay our bills. A number of us are looking to the future and asking what they'll do when it's time to retire or how they'll pay for their children's college. And all of us are asking and saying, my life is super busy. So the question we are facing today is why should we give when we are all short on time, talents, or treasures? Well, here's the thing. The answer to that question lies in one word, motivation. And today, we are called to take a hard look at why we do what we do for the church. Now, we've already discussed our poor servant, who, without any guidance or instruction from his master, was given a huge responsibility. 110 pounds of money was dropped in his lap. And if we take a look at his motivation, it's pretty clear that he was terrified of disappointing his master. Verse 24 and 25 state, 
Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. You can see that he regarded his owner as being somebody who was inflexible and unfair. But in all reality, there's no evidence to really suggest that's true in the passage. What this passage is telling us, however, is that fear is not the proper motivation regarding our attitude towards stewardship. Here we can see that all fear has produced for this man is a negative outcome. And verses 28 through 30 tell us that he is a worthless servant who is cast into the outer darkness. When we approach stewardship with an attitude of fear, we misunderstand our relationship to our Lord. And no matter what your reason for neglecting to give is, I guarantee you it is based in fear. Think about it. Are you motivated by guilt because you feel like you have to give? Are you contributing your time, talents, or resources to the church only because if you didn't, your neighbors would look down at you? Is it also possible that sometimes you don't give at all because you are afraid that you will not be able to make ends meet if you do? In each one of these instances, you are making choices based on fearfulness. If you are motivated by guilt, it's because you fear that you are doing something wrong if you don't give. If you are worried about what your neighbors think, well, that's a type of fear as well. If you are concerned that giving will inhibit your ability to pay bills, you are again leading with that age-old emotion, fear. Now, to be clear, I'm not just talking about giving money. As we have already mentioned, we are asked to give in many different ways. The supplemental text chosen for today's sermon from Acts chapter 1 makes this very clear. What we see in this text is an example of Christians coming forward to help take care of the daily necessities of the church. You see, at the time this text was written, the apostles were trying to do every job, and they needed someone to take over the distribution of food. In other words, this passage is about calling seven people to fulfill the role of being waiters, cooks, and busboys. The apostles needed people to step up and make sure that everyone got fed so that they could go out and spread the word of God. So, let's look at that text. Here the disciples say, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men, full of good repute, full of the spirit of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. Now, some of us may be tempted to think washing tables and serving food is not something I'd want to do. But before you do so, I urge you to take a look at the language used here. The apostles say, seven men of good repute, full of the spirit of wisdom. They're not talking about choosing just anybody here. They are saying that they need the wisest of people to do this task. And why is that? Maybe it's because it takes wisdom to understand that giving of yourself to the church, even in small ways, is a beautiful and necessary thing. Maybe they understand that those who are full of the spirit of wisdom would have the proper motivation. When we base the logic of giving of our time, talents, or resources to the church on the same basis as the fearful servant, we are essentially putting ourselves first. And what I would ask you to do is turn that focus around. When we fear, we only focus on ourselves and all the bad things that could happen. But I would rather ask you to consider placing your focus on the source of all our gifts, Jesus Christ. 
Our Lord and Savior has given us all the things we possess, and the reason we have food, clothing, and shelter in the first place is because of him. As the first article of the Apostles' Creed says, he gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. But here's the thing. Even though he gives all that we have, he gives us even more. He gives us eternal life. When we talk about giving sacrificially, we must first recognize that he has sacrificed for us. Christ gave freely of his body, his blood, and his pain so that we could be saved from an eternity of damnation. He is the ultimate giver who graciously came down from the paradise that is heaven and took on the dirty clothes that is human flesh so that he could suffer on our behalf. So that he could sacrifice himself by feeling each and every one of the sins that mankind has ever committed and will ever commit. He gave sacrificially so that we could live forever with him, free from the sinfulness that is our human condition, so that we could one day be free from the blindness that is sin and see the glorious beauty that is the love and purity of our God and Father. He gave so that our soul will never die and that one day we will have new bodies sustained forever by his gracious love. He sacrificed himself on the cross for us, and he gave sacrificially so that we could have hope in desperate times and remember that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will never overcome it. So, when we consider what to do with our time, talents, and treasures, I would ask you to remember what he has done for you. I would ask you to refocus yourself, not on your fears and worries, but rather on the promise that he has set before us. He will return, and when he does so, we will live forever in his eternal glory, praising him and giving thanks. So, let our minds be at ease. And let our stewardship reflect what he has first done for us so that we may thank him in this world by giving sacrificially. Let us give of ourselves in a way that calls to mind what Christ has done. Just as he gave himself to us, let us all give of ourselves to the church. Not because we are interested in maintaining buildings and creating new programs, but rather by doing so, we can continue to spread the good news that Jesus has died on the cross and our sins can be forgiven. At the beginning of this sermon, we asked the question, why should we give? The answer becomes clear when we remember what God has done and will do for us. Most often, our motivation in life is fear. And we are quick to list all the reasons why we cannot do something. But when we think about the fact that Christ has bled for us, suffered for us, we are given a new motivation. We are thankful. And we give to the church, whether it be in time, talents, or resources, as a result of that thankfulness. One last thing to mention. And this is related to the talents we discussed earlier as a unit of measurement. Isn't it interesting that the way a talent was calculated was based on the average weight of a human being? It's almost as if this parable is saying that we are all talents and that we are all worth our weight in gold to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why shouldn't we then do our best to go forth and spread the joy we have with others and share with them the love of Christ. By doing so, it's like we turn our talents into more talents. 
This is what we do when we give to the church. Because when we devote ourselves to helping, it provides the church with the opportunity and go out to go out and do the ministry that Christ has set before St. Peter's. There are no insignificant ways to help. And I urge each and every one of you to consider what you can do to help further Christ's goal for the church on earth. When you are motivated to share yourself with St. Peter's, you are contributing to far more than keeping the lights on. You are contributing to turning one talent into many and helping the church to reach those who desperately need to hear the word of God. We give because Christ first gave to us. Let us not be like the servant who was so afraid that he hid his talent. Instead, let us rather be like the men who were so full of the wisdom of what Christ had done for them that they gladly served tables in his name. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in true faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.